tone chaser. That thing you hear in your head that you just can't quite get. opportunity last Saturday to interview uh, Steve Rosen, the author of Tone Chaser, my 26-year friendship with Edward Van Halen. He was kind enough to invite me, welcome me into his home in Southern California where we sat and we did a lengthy interview. The book is Tone Chaser. The link is ToneChaserBook.com. Uh, Steve was gracious enough to offer you, the potential readers, a discount at checkout. Um, if you enter under the shipping instructions, discount code GIL, G-I-L, not my idea, uh, you're gonna get a, some percentage off of the shipping. Steve's a cool dude, man. Steve's a cool dude, very approachable. A music fan, an accomplished journalist, and uh, a good-hearted man. So, you know, check out the book. If you haven't already, Tone Chaser. See you all soon. Have a great day, man. How you doing out there? My name's Gil Yola. I'm a guitar player, singer for The Big Three, Southern California cover band. Uh, it's my pleasure, absolute pleasure, to be sitting next to Mr. Steve Rosen, the author of this book, Tone Chaser. Okay, ToneChaserBook.com, one word. You can start making your way there in a minute. Steve, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. All right. All Wonderful right. to meet you, buddy. Absolutely, absolutely. Some of Steve's credits um, go back to more than, a th I, I'm guessing at this point, well over a thousand interviews. Yeah, yeah. Um, his magazine um, articles can be seen in Guitar Player, Guitar World, Rolling Stone, and of course, Cream. I'm gonna date myself there. <laughs> Both of us. Yeah, right? Um, additionally, uh, Steve is a songwriter, a guitarist, and if I'm right, your most recent musical endeavor is, uh, don't tell me, Highway... There you go. Oh, I'm going to draw a blank on it. It's okay. Go ahead. Highway Sentinels. Highway Sentinels. Yeah, man. The reason we're here is, one, this book, Tone Chaser, and secondly, a video, an absolute video that was just supposed to be a joke that I posted on my band's Instagram page on um, Easter Sunday. I am sitting there, I had just got Steve's book in a couple days earlier, and I post this video of Van Halen from a 2012 performance. Someone asked me where it was, I don't remember where it was. All I know is it was from 2012, and they were killing it. They sounded great. During the guitar solo to Ice Cream Man, the sound man faded to black. Halfway through the solo, Roth says, spotlight asshole, wake up. And I'm sitting there, and I get up, and I rewind it, and I'm thinking to myself, I didn't hear what I just, what I think I just heard, and sure enough. So I paused it, grabbed my phone, videotaped it, and as an absolute goof, just as a joke, I posted it on the Big Three Instagram page. Three days later, it has almost 3,500 hits. Six days later, it's just under 22,000 hits. That's part of the story. When I got the book, I was reading the introduction. I'm gonna say this about 10 more times. Tone Chaser, tonechaserbook.com. When I'm reading the forward or the introduction, there's a passage um, that Steve makes reference to this 
something inside of his head telling him, write the book, write the book, write the book. Do not die regretting not writing the book. Okay, I'm going to give you a chance to speak in a minute. <laughs> I'm waiting. His, his, his cat or a will wake him up at 3 o'clock going ballistic. Okay? So Steve writes the book. As I'm reading this, I start to vibrate, and there's something inside of me telling me, this man is approachable. I need to talk to this guy. So I had emailed him saying, I got the book. Thanks very much. And then I emailed him a second time after reading a second email back from him. And I said, okay, there's too much irony, too much coincidence here. Steve, is there any way that I can get you on the phone for 15 minutes? Uh, fast forward the next day, we're on the phone for a little bit. I'm going to read something and then I'm going to shut up. Okay. And I apologize in advance if I ruin this. <laughs> To enable you to become totally absorbed by my story and to see every smile he flashed, to hear every note he played, to smell every cigarette he smoked, and to feel every triumph and sorrow he ever experienced, I had to become two characters, participant and observer. The participant was a dude sitting there with Edward in real time 26 years ago. The observer was a dude sitting at his computer, looking back on those astonishing encounters and attempting to interpret analyze and clarify everything the participant was going through so you the reader might become absolutely and completely immersed in the story tell me about how you came about writing the book and why did the cat wake you up as you see <laughs> how and why did i write tone chaser um firstly that paragraph that you read was sort of that was one of the keys to unlocking me being able to write the book. Um, you know, wanting to bring the reader into that moment, how do I do that? You know, how do I describe in absolute minutia detail um, what it was like sitting there? And I thought, well, I can't do it as one person. Let me split into two people. So that was a really, really key moment when I kind of came up with that. And that's a very... Um, I've never heard of anybody else doing that. And part of me said, well, you can't do that, man. It's never been done before. And I said, fuck it. I hope we can cuss on this thing. Go ahead. Um, it's my book. I'm going to do whatever I want. And if you don't want to read it, don't read it. I wanted people to read it, but I wasn't going to be consumed or restricted by what I thought I should be doing. So getting back to your initial question, you know, um, so uh, in 2003, um, um, I, I don't see Edward Van Halen anymore. The relationship ends, and we were talking earlier, and, and I don't really want to talk about that right now because I, I, I think it would, it would detract from the reader kind of reading about those moments in the book. So if you want to find out, you need to go and get the book. Tonechaserbook.com. There you go. So 2003... Let me backtrack a little bit here. All you want, bro. In 1985, I've known Edward Van Halen for about seven years at that point. I first meet him in June of 77. So this is 85, right? The 80, 1984 record is coming out. Um, I think Sammy has just joined the band or is just about to. So they're arguably one of the biggest bands in the world, right? 1984, uh, I mean, it just, it, it's just like a, 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 another level for the band, right? Um, so. I'm hanging out with Edward, you know, we spent a lot of time together, and I'm thinking to myself, somebody is going to approach him and ask him to write his life story. And I think about that, and I think about that, and I think about that, and I, and I say to myself, you need to ask him. You need to ask him if, if you can be the one to write that book. I am not that kind of a person, uh, so for me to find uh, you know, in, in, in Yiddish, it's called chutzpah. chutzpah. To me, to find the fucking balls <laughs> and nerve, and, and I don't take rejection very well, man. I, it, like, it, it just really decimates me. But I thought, if I do not ask him this question, I, I will forever uh, be regretful. So uh, one day, I'm, I'm up there, up at 5150, and I go, Edward, um, listen, man, you know, writers are going to approach you. They're going to want to write your life story. I'd like to be the person to write that, you know, and kind of puss on a cigarette. And he goes, yeah, man. He goes, of course, you know, I couldn't think of anybody else to write it. And for him to say that to me, it was like, oh, my God, you know, it's just like that's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm floating at that point. So I start working on ostensibly 
what was going to be Edward Van Halen's authorized biography. We signed a couple little simple contracts. There's a copy of the contract. It's written, signed, I believe, by his attorney, maybe, or it's just the two of you? No, it's just the two of us. Okay. Funny yeah. enough, his attorney did not sign it, though that, that contract was... Uh, Valid. It's real. Was in front of the, of the lawyer, you know? So that that is an interesting point. Um, so uh, so I start working on the book. So I'm, I'm out there interviewing uh, band members, you know, guys he's played with in previous bands, friends, guys who are promoting shows out in Pasadena, um, uh, guys who are uh, where he was getting uh, the necks and bodies for his guitars, music teachers, um, everybody, band members. Um, I worked on that book probably for about two or three years pretty seriously. Um, I, I, I wanted Edward to sit down with me. Ed, listen, man, we need to sit down. I need to do interviews with you for the book. I know we've done interviews for magazines where we've talked about guitars and amps, but I need to sit down with you and talk about your family life back in, you know, Amsterdam and what was your relationship like with in, your brother? In the book you touch on, you keep waiting for that call to come. You keep waiting for that call to come. Today's the day. I and keep waiting for the call to come. Steve, it's Edward. Let's sit down, man. I want to do it, you know. Yeah. That call never came. Uh, that book never happened. Uh, fast forward, so this is 85. Fast forward to 2003. Series of events go on. Um, uh, we stopped seeing each other in 2003. I think about that book. I think about it from time to time. Um, you know, part of me uh, tries not to think about the book because I was so disappointed. I thought, oh my God, you know, I, I was so fucking close, you know? So I tried not to think about it, but, but it was always there in the back of my mind. Um, comes to 2020, uh, 17 years later, and I had a couple friends who kept poking me, hey man, you know, you should write a book, you should write a book. And by then I, I, I really thought, it's been such a long time you, you know, one, I, I didn't know if I had the actual mental capacity to do it. You know, I didn't know if I could recall those moments. I didn't know if I had the, honestly, the, the creative chops to do it. If I was going to write that book, it had to be, in my mind, every word had to be perfect. It had to, it, it, it had to be a reflection of who he was as a musician. You know, I, you think of Edward Van Halen playing guitar and every note is perfect and articulated and passionate. And to my mind, that's what the book had to be. It had to be one long 600-page guitar solo, right? Not one long note. And I thought, man, I don't know if I'm capable of doing that. And I kept thinking about it and I kept thinking about it. And right around that time, uh, my cat, Arpeggio, was waking up at these very terrible late, night hours. May he rest in peace. May he rest in peace. You know, first it was like midnight, then it's 1 p.m., sorry, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and he was hungry, or he thought he was hungry. And where I was living um, uh, at the time, I wasn't upstairs, downstairs. Uh, this wasn't Weepaw Way, which I write about. It was, it was a place after Weepaw Way, uh, a street called Jewett, and it was an upstairs, downstairs. So to feed him, I had to go down these stairs. I had to put all the lights on because these stairs were like 1940 that you'd kill yourself. They weren't code, you know, man. And so I'd go and I'd, you know, give him a can of cat food. And of course, he'd sit there looking at it, you know. And now he's revved up. So I'd shut the lights out, man. I'd, I'd try to crawl back into bed and go to sleep. And I was able to do that a little bit, but he kept doing it night after night. And one night I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm going to go to the go to the computer. I'm going to sit down the keyboard. And I remember the the the, the date uh, clearly because it was my birthday, August 24th. August 24th. Right, August 24th, 2020. So I sit down, and and in the back of my head, yes, I was sitting down because I had visions of the book swimming through my head. I didn't know what was going to come out. I didn't know if anything was going to come out. So it's one of those things, you know, you try to let it go and let the book take you somewhere. So I sit down. I've always loved books with wonderful opening lines or opening paragraphs, you know. Uh, Hunter Thompson is one of my favorite writers and uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which is one of the greatest books ever written. And if you haven't read it, go read it. You know, his first line is somewhere, I was somewhere outside of Barstow when I saw the bats. I mean, it's so genius. <laughs> it, it just, 
Oh God, you yeah. know, so. Let, let me jump in here for a second. Sure. I wrote something down here. I was trying to do this without my footnotes, but I'm gonna have to. Yeah, man. Word picture, a description in words, especially one that is unusually vivid. You create word pictures. I learned that word when I was probably in the eighth grade and it's never left my psyche. You create word pictures here, so please continue. Well, I, I love that, man, because honestly, I, I tried to create word pictures on, on every page and that's you why I, I had to go in this infinite detail and, and reflecting back on your uh, fine reading of, that, of the intro paragraph, um, uh, you know, observe participant and uh, an observer. You know, so this observer could really, man, fill in the holes for that picture. And you know, because he's looking, he's seeing everything. He's seeing way more than this Steve Rosen guy just sitting there on the sofa. Man, he's seeing the whole thing. So he can really help. Is he telling you sit up straight? Sit up straight. Exactly. <laughs> which I tend to hunch, and I hate myself for that. So, uh, so I'm back there. It's August 24th, 2020, and I'm sitting down, and I'm thinking word pictures, you know. How do I capture that reader, that person who was used to hearing this guitar player playing these astonishing riffs, and Van Halen fans are rabid, man. They are, they are protective of the band, but they love Edward, and, y y you know, so... How, how do I do this, you know? And, and it couldn't be, well, I knew Edward, you know, a long time ago, and I'm going to write a book. I, I, people would have gone to sleep. They would have dismissed the book. So I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and somehow I, I reflect back the story I just told you on the original book. So it becomes something like, hey, you're, you're reading this book because you're not reading that book, and this is a long sentence, and this is why. And I'm thinking... That's pretty clever. Yeah. You do a lot of, in the book, um, the writer, the observer, the observer has a thought bubble, and the writer's poking the thought bubble and letting things out little by little. That's exactly uh, Okay, all right. It's exactly. Okay. Cause, yeah, because this writer doesn't know as much as the observer. So sometimes he's got to sit. Don't forget about this. Don't forget about that. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes he's got to sit back, and I put the observer in what I call my notes section. So mm -hmm. I call them various things. First notes, second notes. Yes, uh, yes. Whole base, notes. Base notes. Base notes. <laughs> blue notes, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I, 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 I kept writing and, and I, I, I got, I think that first paragraph or maybe a couple of paragraphs and at the end of it, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm reading it and I'm rereading it. And I'm thinking, wow, that, that, that's pretty good. Next, next day, you know, um, actually, I don't think I looked at it the next day. Um, but again, <laughs> that night, you know, uh, Arpeggio is up, he's screaming, he's hungry, feed him. Go back and I read what I've written, you know, and that's the real test, man, because trust me, there's no harsher critic in this world than me reading my own stuff. The next day. The next day. Yeah. And um, I'm looking at it and I'm reading and I'm going, wow, that that is pretty good. That That leads somewhere. If I can just hang on to that and I can... I can create that voice and, and keep that, you know, so I kept writing and then I talked a little bit about um, about the book uh, that I was going to write back in 85 and, and I think I touched on a little bit of my background and I try to set up about the observer and the participant, you know, and try to make sense of that and explain it so it doesn't become so, uh, you know, obscure that people go, what is he talking about, you know, because if you lose somebody in the intro, man, they're lost. So, long answer to your question, Gil. That's all right. Keep um, going, man. Keep going. So, um, yeah, at that point, uh, August 24th, 2020, I wrote every single morning, and it was the morning, man. And, um, I, you, you know, you kind of get on a roll, and sometimes, I, you know, it's like I'd feed the cat, and I was, like, so tired. I was like, oh, man. But I, I was really afraid that if I let one day go by, I was going to lose that thing, man, and, and this thing was going to run away from me. So every day, probably, again, you know, depending on when the cat woke me up, from <laughs> 2 or 3 in the morning till it was light, so it gets light, then, I, I don't know, man, 5 or 6 or 7, it was a good 3 or 4 or 5 hours every morning. Bang it out. 14 months later, Tone Chaser is done. And honestly, so I'm getting to like page 350, and I realized... Dude, I, I'm not even, you know, right. I'm not even halfway there. Most most music bios are about, uh, uh, they're about 350 pages long. I think they're about 125,000 words. So, man, I'm at 180,000 words and I'm not even close. 
for all the interviews I'd done and for all the gifted guitar players I'd met up with to that point, nothing could have prepared me for the day that Edward called. Okay. You, you see that? Wow. <laughs> yeah, this comes. So, Edward Van Halen calls. <sighs> exactly. Edward Van Halen calls. You know, I'm trying to recall that moment. You know, I'm trying to recall the, the, the moment <laughs> in the book. The Black Rotary Phone. The Black Rotary Phone. If anybody remembers Black Rotary Phone. Bakelite phones, right? You lift it yeah. up in the big, heavy receiver. Um, he calls and he wants to come over to my pad. This is when I was living up in uh, the Hollywood Hills, mm -hmm. um, up on Weepaw Way. Do you still have the Marshall stack that you brought from Jim Marshall? I still have the Marshall stack. I have a Les Paul and a Fender Stratocaster. So he calls and I, the chronology is difficult to remember. I had actually interviewed Ed previously but it was a phone interview. I remember. I right. Remember. And that was and that was the first interview. That was that's the first interview. We're talking about the second interview here. So um, uh, that was a phone interview. And that was set up set up by Warner Brothers Records. Mm -hmm. Backtracking just a little bit. So going back to June 77, I met Edward Van Halen for the very first time at the Whiskey. Whiskey. I don't want to talk about that. I want them to buy the book. <laughs> so we're not talking about that? We're not talking okay. about that. Okay. We're not going to talk about how you, I purposely designed this. I don't want to okay. talk about how he met Eddie. Okay. I don't want to talk about the first interview. I want to jump ahead to the second interview. Okay. If you prefer to do something else, brother, this is your time. Okay. Okay. But I definitely, I'm trying to bait you guys. I'm trying to bait you if you haven't figured it out already. Okay. <laughs> cool. cool. So the phone rings and it's Edward Van Halen. Yeah. And you know, uh, I stayed, you know, and, 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 and again, I, I, I had to interview him as a phoner. Um, uh, I, had never, I hadn't seen him again since the first time. And he wants to come over. I go, <laughs> Edward Van Halen, by the second record, is still living at home with his parents. Right. Which is a very European thing to do, right? Those families tended to live together. So I'm, I'm thinking, Ed, I'll... I'll drive out to Pasadena. No, man, I'll drive out to your place. Sure, Edward Van Halen, you drive out to my little pad in the Hollywood Hills. So he drives out, and, it, you know, it, it's just one of those moments that is so surreal. It's, it's you know, times I, I wonder if it really happened. Um, you know, so he drives up, and he comes in the house, and what's the first thing he does? That's back up. Okay. That's back up. As I waited for Ever to arrive that day, I looked around me and thought, yeah, this feels right. It's the kind of place where a rock writer might live. The walls were covered with photos of some musicians I'd interviewed to that point. As I look around your current place, Steve invited me to his home. I'm sitting in Steve's home right now. Very cool, kind of surreal. Uh, the walls were covered with photos of some of the musicians I'd interviewed to that point. A comfortable couch lined the wall, one wall opposite where shelves were containing my book books turntables receiver and speakers so he's on his way to your place you invite him over okay now there's a lot here but i'm going to read this yeah. okay because it's pertinent and it sets up where you're going next my coffee cup emptied my brain swimming with a sweet caffeine buzz i heard a car pull up on the street below i looked out front of my window and saw some beater parked uh, in front of my garage and assumed that couldn't have been his car since I expected him to pull up in something fast, shiny, and exotic. I went into a mild peak of anxiety because I wanted to keep that spot free for his arrival. I opened my front door, started down the stairs, and saw the driver's side door opening. I was about to unleash a fury of the same inst- I was about to release, unleash fury of the same instant I recognized the person exiting the car. It was Edward. He slammed the door and said, Steve! <laughs> now he's at your house. So he's at my house, and I almost screamed at Edward Van Halen for parking in front of my house because he's in that piece of shit car. Uh, oh, I forget what it is. I, I maybe mention it later on, but people, Van Halen fans, know what that car is. And he was so proud that he spent 700 bucks on it, and he spent about $680 too much. Oh, I mean, it was a piece of crap. I, I, you know, I think by his second record, he's got to be making money, you know, but... 
That was Edward. So, you know, he comes up the steps, you know, and I'm looking at him thinking, oh, my God, this guy. You know, the first record had come out, you know. Um, I don't think the second record was out yet. Um, that's when he comes over, and, he, and that's when we go back down to his car, and he plays me a tape of what is going to be Van Halen 2. And I'm listening and going, oh, my God, and I'm trying to keep the, the, the riffs in my head, no, that, that, that's a fast one, that's a fast shuffle, and, and uh, you know, and it's like, I have, I'm not writing any notes down, thinking, how am I going to fucking remember this, you know? And then we go back to the house, and he pulls, pulls out, I think, the, the strat that I had, which I described as the brown piece of shit that, that I sounded like garbage on, that, that, I, wouldn't stay in tune. that I couldn't stay in, keep in tune, and then he picks it up, and he sounds like a fucking god on high. And, you know, he, he's talk, we're talking about the songs, and he's playing me the riffs, acoustically on an electric guitar. And look, we all know how amazing he was and how brilliant he was and the brown sound and, and live what he did. It's an entirely different thing. Listening to somebody playing on an electric acoustically and now you can hear, you know, every pick attack, and there's no sustain, and there's no hiding behind anything. May I? Yeah, man, go okay. ahead. Okay, it's totally pertinent to where you're at. Excellent. Okay. So there I was, sitting three feet away from the undisputed maestro of things, all things, all things strings, playing my guitar. <laughs> all things strings. <laughs> That's when you know you're in the presence of somebody special, right? I mean, yeah. they say that, you know, if you can tell somebody who it is by one, one note, and there are some astonishing guitar players in this world. There aren't many guys that you can hear them play one note. In Yngwie Malmsteen is going to rip 33 notes in seven seconds. Jeff Beck will bend one note exactly. three different ways in that same duration and say much more exactly. than most people can. Jeff, Edward, you know, Hendrix, uh, Richie Blackmore, uh, I think it's pretty unsung. But uh, yeah, it was remarkable. So I'm, I'm, I'm watching him play these riffs and, and you, you know, watching his, his right hand attack and the, the way his fingers, you know, were placed on the fretboard and, and, and I talk about in there how long his fingers were. And all these guys have fingers like that. Steve Vai, my God, have you ever seen his fingers? Met him once. And there's some pictures. Met him we, once. We can even go right, and you can see their, their fingers, and mine, mine are like these little mutated stumps, you know, and they're not like just tree <laughs> limbs, you know? So, uh, yeah, so Edward Van Halen is sitting on my couch, smoking a cigarette in my place, which is making me nauseous, because I was susceptible to migraine headaches, and cigarette smoke was one of the key triggers. And I'm inhaling his cigarette smoke and thinking, my God, please don't let this day ever end. You know, uh, it, it was just one of those high watermarks in, in, in my life. And I knew it at the time. I, I realized that, you know, being there with him, um, you know, a, a nascent part of his career that, you know, he's starting to get big, but it's still on his second record. So he's not, he's not a legend quite yet, you know. So in context, and I'm leaving a lot out intentionally because I want you to get the book, all right? But in context, what's going on is Eddie Van Halen is teaching Steve how to do the hammer-ons. Yeah. Okay? So having said that, <laughs> as I played it, and this was after several attempts, and you are very self uh, defacing would be, or uh, self-deprecating would be the word I want to use here. I am the and worst. <laughs> you have to get in line, buddy. So, in context, Eddie Van Halen's at his house. They're playing guitar, and Eddie's teaching him how to do the hammer-ons. As I played it, I heard Ed recorded voice. So, again, context, he's listening to tapes as he's writing this book. Exactly. I heard um, Ed's recorded voice in the background saying, That's it! Two little words. Seven letters and an apostrophe, and I was moved and touched by just as by that just as about any compliment I was ever paid. Okay, from a humanistic perspective, um, you touch on it. It's almost like there's two people, 
two people in the room, two, individu two individuals in the room, you and Edward, but four people. There's you, the child in you, and there's Ed and the child and him that's asking for potato chips. And you touch on that story too. <laughs> that's good, man. Okay, there's something developing here, okay? I have friends that are more like brothers. I don't call it friendship, I call it brotherhood. There's a brotherhood, there's a thread being woven here, right? I mean, I love that you, that you see it like that, man, because I really believe that's what it was. You know, people will ask the question, well, when, when along that, you know, along your journey, did you become friends with Edward Van Halen? And, you know, it's, it's an impossible question to quantify. I mean, I can't say two years and three days into it, you know, but that kind of a moment... For him to, obviously I butchered the fuck out of the thing. For him, and maybe this is a child in him that, that wanted that reassurance from his mother. And that is a relationship that we talk about a little bit, you know. And, and maybe there was something that he got from me without trying to be the, the fan, but, but trying to just... Uh, just give him these things that I think that maybe he needed or wanted in his life. For him to say that, that's it. He didn't have to say it. He and I'm sure it. I still... I think he meant it. I'm, I'm in the room to fly and I think he meant it. No, no, <laughs> and, and, and I believe he did. But, but, but as you pointed out, I, he really understood how desperately, and I say desperately, I wanted to hear it. Because I was... I was never a great guitar player. I was a good guitar player. But for, for this guy, for Picasso to say, yeah, good picture. You know, uh, uh, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah that, that child. Really, yeah. yeah, so the four people, the child, and yeah, for him asking for potato chips and things <laughs> like that. This book really, it resonates with me, man. That's so cool, you I, know, and, and people have used the word, and I love the word, and I never thought about it, is that I, I humanized Edward, and I, I, I mean, subconsciously, that's what I was trying to do. I didn't think that that was going to be possible, um, <laughs> you, you know. But 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 if I did that in in, in even the smallest way, um, then then I, I I really succeeded in what I was trying to do with the book, um, because there was that other side of him, um, which which made him all the more remarkable, you know. I mean, a lot of rock stars you look at and they don't seem to be vulnerable at all. Still at the second interview, Edward returned for a second visit somewhere around January 1979. Only this time, he brought a yellow and black striped guitar with him, which would later come to be known as the Bumblebee guitar. You played Bumblebee. I did. I, uh, uh, unfortunately, Bum Bumblebee is resting with Dimebag Barrel. Oh, uh, right. You know, it, it, the story is true. That's it's that's it. Oh yeah, no, no, I, I'm, I'm sure it's true. He was, a, he loved the dime. I'm sure he, he, uh, he let you play Bumblebee. You know, and 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 <laughs> Ed was never was never precious with his instruments at all. No, never. And and I, I don't think you've gotten to that chapter yet about the Les Pauls. No. Oh my God, you'll love that chapter, readers. You will love this chapter. Two of the most beautiful Les Pauls you've ever seen in your life, and what Edward does to oh, them. Oh, he cuts them out. Well, eventually he would, but even the way he treated them when he was at the house. But yeah, it's like, hey man, he goes, yeah, you want to to play my guitar? I go, yeah. It played like shit. I mean, it it, it just, you think that it would play itself? For me, it wasn't like that, you know? I mean, he has his, uh, you know, his vibrato bar is locked. Right. In, in other words, so it, 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 you can't, and you know, when you can pull back on it, you know, pull up and... It's infinitely easier, and the tension is much less. His, because I think he had like four springs, you know? I mean, it really... Yeah, which is why to get a dive down. Ex exactly, you know. Um, and I suppose, you know, if you're used to that, you know, it it, it, it it sounds amazing, but for me, it wasn't, you know. And um, so 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 he was, he's playing my Defender Strat, you know, and then at a, at a point in time, I realized, you know, he probably wanted his guitar back. He goes, oh, you want to trade back? I goes, no, nah, I just play, you know. It didn't matter what he was playing. I mean, it, it really did. You can tell it was him. Oh, my God.
And on the other side of it, I sounded equally as bad on any guitar I played. So I had that going for me, you know? So I'm, I'm going to touch on your uh, self-deprecating uh, nature and quality for a second here. Uh, after sitting there for what must have been around 15 minutes and demolishing and destroying every riff he tried to show me, <laughs> uh, he did the most unlikely thing. Go on, try this one for a while and hand it over the Bumblebee guitar. It's totally different. The next just different than that of a Fender. Listening to the tape, I can hear him passing the guitar to me while I handed him, uh, oh, oh, while I handed over my strap to him. I real chested the Bumblebee. Um, next I heard on the tape was something so startling I never would have believed it possible had I not heard with my own ears. I was playing like Eddie Van Halen. I was zooming up and down the neck, flawless execution, articulating intricate hammer-ons and whammy figures and mimicking his flutter technique like I'd been born with it. While I was strumming around the frets, Ed confessed, I didn't know you can play like that. Steve, you're a really good guitar player. <laughs> He's joking. <laughs> You had me, and I'm like, oh, man. Did oh, I have man. That? Did I get you? It, absolutely. In truth, I was the same guitar player as I was on mine and actually sounded worse on the Bumblebee because I had never played it before. And it really did play all together differently from that Fender. <laughs> Favorite Eddie Van Halen memory? There are so many. I mean, you know, him saying that's it, that, that's unbelievable. Um... You know, him saying to me, yeah, man, you can write the book. There couldn't be anybody else. That was unbelievable. Um, you know, we'd have conversations, and, and I write about that, uh, and I call those the um, the Twilight tapes, mm -hmm. where the stuff got really deep, and it wasn't really just about music. It was just two people talking, you know. He would say things to me, and he'd be supportive. Uh, uh, um, God, it was just simple things, you know. The, the first time... You know, because I'd see him, you know, and, you know, we say hello and stuff. And then the first time, you, you know, uh, you know, he he hugs me. I thought, oh, my God, that, who, that's amazing, you know. And then, you know, he hugged me and then he'd kiss me on the cheek. He told you he loved you. He said, did. I love you, Steve. He said that all the time, man. And, and I have that on the tape, you know. If nobody believes that, it's the truth, you know. And um, I believe he did, you know, in his way. And, um, you know. I'll be honest, it was hard for me to say I love you, you know, but I did, uh, you know, I'm not that kind of person. But again, I think it was that European thing. Mm -hmm. It was just so many of those amazing moments. He just felt, maybe he felt so, I, I don't know, man, um, secure and I had self-respect for myself and, um, you, you know, um, trying not to measure myself against oh. this guy because, I mean, that you know, you can't. You can't do that. And I, I've seen people try to do that, and um, it doesn't end up well, because no one's going to measure up to somebody like that. I want to thank you once again for your time. It's been a pleasure meeting you. Uh, I look forward to listening to your music online, and hopefully to uh, stand in front of you at some point in the future, man. That's great, man. I appreciate you coming down here and hanging out and saying all these nice things about the book. And... Um, yeah, if I just might say it in closing, um, as maybe the most modest person on the face of the planet, um, I think this is a good book, and I think that if you're a Van Halen fan, you will really walk away learning something about Edward Van Halen. And if you get the book and you don't feel that way, you let me know and I'll send you back your money. So, um, uh, I, I think it's a book that, that, that deserves to be out there in the world. And yeah, I, I, I hope you check it out. And uh, I, hope, I hope you'll love it as much as I love writing it. Thanks, guys. Thanks for your time, you guys. ToneChaserBook.com. Have a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy. Bye-bye. Hey, Tone Chasers. How are you? Look, guys, I, I hope you dug the interview. Listen. I know a lot of you have written and left comments and, and, and you have dug the interview. If you'd like to show your appreciation, I would really love a review up on Amazon. Just go to Amazon. You can type in Ch Tone Chaser. You'll find my page. Uh, if you didn't buy the book on Amazon, it's cool. You can still leave a review. So that's about it, guys. I will uh, talk to you later. Um, volume three is here. T3. 
So I hope you guys have your copies. And if not, uh, you can go check it out on my uh, webpage, ToneChaserBook.com. See you, everybody. Thank you. V for Van Halen.